Feel good fathers, welcome to the show. I'm joined by my guest today, Kyle. He is the founder and business owner of Gillette Solutions. Uh, he specializes in helping dad business owners overcome uh, any sort of mindset issues and put in great habits and routines to grow and scale their company. Uh, we're gonna have a little bit of talk about that, really excited. He's got a dad guide specifically. The link to that description to that will be down in the description. And then we're gonna talk about leadership at home, listening, empowerment, and accountability. Welcome to the show, Kyle. Hey, Jay. Thanks. It's great to be here. I like the lion in the background. I don't know what that represents for you, but it's super cool. Is that a, it's a longboard, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, it's a longboard. So my brother-in-law, he loves to do uh, that old, thick tattoo style of, oh, okay. of drawings. Yeah. And he was commissioning and kind of in, in – that's like a – it's a – I guess they – I don't know what specific technique it is, but they burn the lines into it. Oh, cool. Yeah. So that's a full, and the, so the lion, I'm a Leo and it's like, I've always identified with the lion. It's kind of that thing. And, um, I love suits. I love looking good. It's one of my, it's my things. It's a, it's a big part of feel good fatherhood to, to dress well, have some good style. And that's what the whole thing is. Awesome. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. What, uh, <clears throat> what animals or symbolism is really important for you in your life? Animals. Well, you know, I worked at a pet resort. And so for me, I, I love me some dogs. Uh, we, it was a, it was part of a men's mentoring program. And so we ran the pet resort with a hundred to 150 dogs a day. And uh, I was, I was the, the, it wasn't a business because it was underneath a nonprofit. So it's, I can't say I was the owner, but I was the general manager, I guess. And yeah. I loved I love that job. Maybe my favorite. Like I really love what I do now, but there's something about working with dogs every single day. So my, my spirit animal, quote unquote, would probably be a dog. Just they're happy, man. They're just dang happy. And my dog almost died recently and she's still alive, wagging her tail. So I'm in a, in a good place when, when it comes to thinking about dogs. That's for sure. I love it. I, I think if I think of like, what is my bliss? It's just like throwing the ball in the backyard, just like coming back and forth and you know, uh, I love, I love amping my dog up. So, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, you know, they, they, they kind of watch you as you're moving through the house and they'll sit there. Like if they want to go outside, they'll sit by the door or if they want food, they'll sit by the food dish or whatever. And they're just kind of watching like, Hey, are you noticing I'm over here? <laughs> are you going to do this thing? Yep. And then, uh, and she's pretty chill most of the time. And then I'll just amp her up and it gets super excited. And she's like hopping around and, and she's developed this new thing where she hops on like her hind legs. And oh, she gets nice. really excited. <laughs> That's awesome. That is cute. Yeah. I, I remember one of my favorite experiences working at the pet resort is we they did all day off leash play. And so we would we would figure out who to put with who so they can get along all day. It's very unique in the pet resort world to do it that way. And it was a lot of fun to figure it out, get to know the dogs, and then help them to get to know each other. So we had chain link fences so you could see through them. And, and of course, the dogs are pooping everywhere and they're playing and all the chaos of running a pet resort. But I remember walking into one of the quote unquote cages. It's really a large play area and scooping the poop and then walking out and, and watching the dogs, just pausing and watching the dogs. And they were playing and running around and wrestling around. And I, and I had this thought that just clicked in my head. And there's a there's a quote that says, who of you can add a single hour to your life? And it just ran into my head. And the quote is based on how we worry so much in life. We get anxious and we worry. And then it ends with who you can add a single hour to your life. And I watched the dogs and I'm like, they don't worry. They, they don't worry. And then it clicked that worry is about time. And these dogs don't have any notion of time, really. Not like we do. They do to a certain degree, but not like us. And they're not worried about yesterday or worried about tomorrow. They're just in the present. And from that moment forward, worry has, I haven't gotten rid of it, let's be honest, but it has diminished significantly and they're just so freaking happy and they, they are present. That's the thing. They're just present. I think for me, that has been the biggest lesson as a dad, as a business owner, as a husband is like, I need to be present. If I'm not present, then I'm worrying about yesterday, worrying about tomorrow and getting anxious about things that haven't even occurred yet or already happened. And so being present resolves that in, in major ways, not 100%, but major ways. Yeah. And, and we both work with a lot of dads. So I'd, I'd love to hear some great concrete examples because I think that this worry for the future, this not being present, 
I, I'm not drawing a direct analogy or a comparison between dogs and kids, but kids have the same thing, right? Yeah. Like young kids, they have no concept of time. There's they're, they're tired and they're awake and they're hungry and they're pooping and they want to play and they want to spend time with you, but they have a very similar mannerism with life. Yeah, it's true. I think one of, one of those is we, we went to a, a town that's about three hours from us and went on a ferry and had all these wonderful experiences for five days with extended family. There's 15 of us. We're pickleballing, going to the lake, talking, playing. And they've got, my kids have four other cousins. And so they're sleeping all in the same room and having a blast. We go back home and within like four seconds of getting home, they're bored. <laughs> within <laughs> four seconds of getting home, they're fighting. And I'm like, guys, do you even remember what happened? And, and to a certain degree, I'm not sure they do, you know, it's there of course, but to a right. certain degree they they don't remember it's there. And now they're back to their old habits of what it's like to be in mom at mom and dad's house and mom and dad's house is boring or mom and dad's house is however it is that they experience it at times. So it's fascinating to me that you can have five days of f like true tons of fun and you get home and you're a basket case within seconds. <laughs> so I'm not sure what that is. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I, I absolutely love it. I think it's the, you know, there's that, um, that routine idea, you know, there your our memories and our emotions are anchored to places and things and yep. objects and really in relationships. And so the moment there's a comfort, right, there's a comfort to walking in the home. And then the brain's like, Oh, great. Now that we're here, we can activate these other things that I want to think about. Yeah, right. That, well, how, I mean, how would you, you know, if we let's, let's treat this, this case example as with a dad. So dad comes home and does that. How does, how does dad handle that? Where he's the one creating the problem or the kids are the one that are the problem. Let, let's suppose the, the kids, the kids. Yeah. Well, first of all, we'll go backward to what I said before. Like, how do you get yourself anchored and present? Uh, because it's up to me. I'll tell you a quick story. My youngest is seven and she uses language sometimes that that is I don't like she'll say or my wife doesn't like she'll say I hate you mm. and that sucks <laughs> I don't yeah. want to say that it's pretty violent language it's pretty nasty language and I would say nine months ago her and I were bumping heads we have very similar personalities right so we're sure. we're bumping heads instead of synergizing we're bumping heads and the more you can get to know in whatever modality of personalities the more you can get to know what personality of your kids is it's great because then you can pivot and adjust and adapt to fit their personality but i wasn't i was i wasn't i was being bad dad and i was not adjusting my behaviors and my my own personality to fit my seven-year-old because she's not going to do that she doesn't even know how right so i went to this conference and it was a long two-week conference big giant training amazing experience and part of it was they challenged you to go through this forgiveness exercise where you hmm. put you put this person on the stage that you need to forgive you this made up you know imaginary stage and, and yeah. they're in front of you on the stage and you're up in a mezzanine looking at them and and putting positivity towards them you know positive light energy prayers sure. however you people see it and you're doing that and then you go and sit with them on the stage and and tell them that that you're sorry can you forgive me for what i've done wrong i forgive you for the things that you've done wrong to me, would you forgive me? And so I did this exercise with my daughter in my head. No, not for real, but in my head at this conference. And I come back and within probably hours, she's <laughs> yelling at me and slamming the door. And so then I go into a room and instead of being pissed off, like I used to be, I open the door calmly. I'm like, Lydia, I don't like it when you do that. I don't appreciate it. And then I close the door and walked away. The next day, it was like there was this switch that went off in her brain that dad dad isn't angry at me. Dad doesn't hate me. I never did. And I never said that. But that's what was going on in her head. Mm. And I used to always have to elicit the words I love you from her. And that day or the next day, whenever it was, I was going to drive to the gym or drive somewhere. And she ran out of the house and said, dad, 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 wait, you didn't say, you didn't say bye. You didn't say bye. And she, she said, I love you and hugged me. Mm. And it was that pivot. But for me, it was about me being present, about me changing my mindset and attitude because 
until I do that, their habits aren't going to change. And so yes. once I do that, then back to your scenario, I can then adjust my behaviors to help them calm down. And I've got other stories I could share about what that looks like, but I'll stop there because uh, it, it has to start with me. I, I love it. So there's, there's so many different components here that are really applicable to feel good fathers, right? So the first being paying attention to what's happening in your state. And I, I'm a really big fan of Jeff Bridges. He's one of my favorite actors. I grew up watching Tron. Like it was like the, one of the first movies that I just fell in love with. And I just kind of followed his career and everything like that. And then he wrote this book. It was like the dude in the Zen master. So uh, we were actually joking off air about bowling and how we were both yeah. both really enjoying bowling. And it's like the Big Lebowski is like probably one of the best movies ever made. <laughs> so it's like it's just amazing and psychedelic and super weird and chill and not chill and like high stress and low stress. Like it's like everything. It has some of the most memorable scenes I, I think I've ever seen shot of like regular everyday people caught in like extraordinary circumstances that I've ever seen. Plus uh, flee from... Um, Oh goodness, uh, California. What's the, what's the name of the band? Red, Red Hot, Hot Chili Red. Peppers. Yeah. Red Hot Chili Peppers is in it. So there's that all the, all this kind of stuff, <laughs> and he has a really great scene or two in there as well. Um, but the catching yourself in your emotion, you know. And I, I brought up Jeff Bridges in the Zen because a, a big piece of that is like the row 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 your boat. Like when you're in an emotion, it's like the emotion isn't bad. The emotion is the emotion. But when we combine that mindset of like emotion is neither good or bad, it just is, row, row, yep. row your boat as it happens, plus the, okay, the reflection that you were talking about of this is how I want to show up. This is what I'm trying to elicit. This is the understanding and the forgiveness. Like that, that was such a really cool example. Uh, it, it was funny. My follow-up was going to be, and what happens when dad is in a rough, in a rough place? And I was like, I don't know. I think, I think your example counts for both. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, I'll tell you a real quick story to give you a little bit more nuanced about what I've done before. Uh, this was when my kids were in school, so before summer hit, and I was downstairs making breakfast because I'm the, I do the breakfast in the morning, making eggs, and I was grumpy. No reason. Just, you know, I call it PMS, pissed off man stage. You know, <laughs> women have it, but we have it too, pissed off man stage. And that's where I was. I was in a pissed off man stage. And so my youngest, no, my middle kid, whatever, it doesn't matter. One of my kids came downstairs and I was making breakfast and I made a, I made a snappy comment to her. I don't even know what it was. And then she was in a mood it, instantly. Right. Then my, then my youngest came downstairs and she got all bitter with my middle because my middle was in a mood and had said something to her. And then all of a sudden they're bickering at each other. And my youngest, as I told you already, she's kind of a, you know, she swings big time with her emotions. And so they started bickering. And then my oldest comes downstairs right after that. And then they both start yelling at my oldest. And I'm like, this is totally my fault. Like I set the mood. I, mm. I get to choose the mood in my house and I set it. And then I said to my youngest, I don't even remember what I said, but I know that I changed my tone. Cause that was the key. The tone was the key. So I changed the tone of voice, which changed the tone in the room. And then I did something silly that made one of them laugh. And then it relaxed the situation and I put on some music and then the rest of the morning was great. But it was in that moment that I realized that I'm, I get to set the tone in the, in the house more than anyone else does. It's up to me. You know, my wife can too, but it's really up to me. And so I made a little tiny pivot in that moment. And this, this scene that I just shared with you was like 15 seconds. You know, it wasn't sure. 10 minutes. It was 15 seconds. Just this whole <laughs> pendulum of emotions. So I think that, I think the core thing that I would draw from this, which is really great is just that full ownership and responsibility for everything that's happening. Yeah. You know, and that's really the, I don't, I don't really know if there's better things to do than, than that. I think it's one of the the greatest, the greatest gifts that's given to everybody is that you have full control over yourself and also every, your state. And I think here, I, I learned this from, um, from, from a great dude, uh, John uh, Berghoff, which was fantastic, which was that your emotions impact everybody else in the room. Yeah. And so when you're in a state, you're impacting everybody else. It doesn't, and, and I say state, and we commonly understand that as like a negative emotion, but if you're in a great mood, everybody else is having a great time. And so our emotional status for coming into things is, is this really great gift. 
which is why you'll see a lot of you know high performers talking about energy and enthusiasm you know co- approach everything with energy and impu- enthusiasm yeah yeah uh, when you were sharing that it made me think about a question that i often ask my clients because they'll they'll come to me with a problem of course right well, why else would they come to me so they have some sort of sure. a problem and i'll ask them how do you do it and it's an interesting question because they I often get a, a return. What do you mean? How do I, how do I do it? And then I try not to explain to them what I mean, uh, <clears throat> unless I really have to. But underneath it, what I'm asking them is reverse engineer how you do it wrong. Mm. So sometimes I'll say, how do you do it wrong? And then, then I'll say, teach me how to do it wrong. And what's fascinating about it is they know how they're doing it wrong. They know real quickly. They can give me this whole narrative of what they do wrong. And I, I usually, if they still don't quite get it, I'll ask, I'll tell my story of taking my phone downstairs and distracting myself away from my kids and wife right after work, you know, I'm wasting, wasting my life away for 45 minutes while my kids are begging me for attention. And so I'll tell them how I do that the wrong way. And then it clicks for them. They get it. And they tell me their story of how they do the thing the wrong way. But when, mm. you, when you do that, now all of a sudden you get it. It's this third, it's this disassociated experience of seeing yourself do it wrong. And then you can correct the behavior because you're not in it. You're disassociated, which is what we need to do to correct any bad behavior. We have to disassociate. And so that it's a, it's a very powerful question to, to ask ourselves. I love that because the thing that keeps us in the funk and the thing that keeps us in the bad behaviors. And I learned this and we're both Christians. So we talk about this is that the thing that keeps the sin coming back and the thing that allows the enemy to win, the thing that gets in between your relationship with God and that kind of jazz is that you allow the self-talk. It's like you do the thing and then you're like, damn, I'm a bad human being. (laughs) Then you're like, Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Or, Oh man. Or even the, the, the nice way of beating yourself up is, Oh, I could have done that better. It's like, well, it, did, it happened, right? Like it happened. And sure, there's a learning. Sure, you can say that. But so many of us disguise, I find so many of us say, well, I could have done that better. And even I do this with myself. It's like, oh, I could have done that better. It's like, well, in that moment, I did the best I could. And so now given that, let me disassociate as you're saying and say, all right, moving forward. And so like my pattern in these moments is to, um, to forgive, release and bless, right? So my prayer in these moments when I do that is like, all right, well, I forgive myself for not for number one, I forgive myself for the action. Number two, I forgive myself for saying I could do it better. Number three, I'm, uh, I guess that was 1.5. So number two is, um, Hey God, I'm giving this to you. I, I don't want to carry this anymore. I, I can't carry this anymore. I'm giving this to you. And then the third is, uh, please, you know, bless me or please bless my future actions or something like that. And I think that pattern works really good for us, but I think it's also very similar to what you were saying with, seeing your people on the stage and blessing them, asking for forgiveness, doing that kind of jazz. Cause let me tell you that works super great for other people. Hey, Hey, I forgive. Hey, Kyle, I forgive you for making that really awful comment just a second ago. This is for those listening. This didn't happen. This is an (laughs) example. (laughs) Hey Kyle, I forgive you for doing that thing that you did a second ago. And then I would, and in my head, I would be saying that then I would be like, Hey God, I'm giving, I'm giving this, I'm releasing that to you. Please hold this for me. I mean, that's why he died on the cross. And then, um, well, that's one of the benefits of him dying on the cross. Okay. I'm not going to get into it too much. Right. So there's that piece. I'm releasing it to you. And then, Hey, would you please bless Kyle? Would you please bless Kyle? Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the pattern now that I'm adopting. I'd love to hear your reactions. Yeah. You know, it, it made me think about the stat that I recently found because I'm doing research for a a book I'm writing. The book is called The Language of Faith, and it's all about the words that we use Mm. that mess up our faith. And and we could go into that in a moment here. But um, the stat is from the National Science Foundation. Their studies show that 80% of our thoughts are negative. Oh, yeah. It's awful. And so my heart in this book that I'm writing and in the work that I do with my clients is let's reverse that. Let's flip that because let's be honest, we're not going to get to hundred percent positive. And plus we may not want to because some of the negativity actually helps us grow. Right. So we don't want hundred percent positive, but if we're 20% negative and 80% positive, that changes, that changes your whole entire life. But we're in this small group at our church and 
I can't remember how many people are in it, but I would say three quarters of the folks in the group use language that is the, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, it's a lot, it's hard, I'm a mess, this language. And I'm like, and I've confronted them about it carefully, nicely, and with good information and from my heart, right? But of course you are, because your your conscious mind is the goal setter and your unconscious mind is the goal getter. So if you tell your conscious mind, your unconscious mind, technically, that I'm stressed, I'm anxious, I'm a mess, I'm whatever, if you say it enough, it becomes true, especially Mm. when it's something as simple as that. You know, you can't say I'm going to make a million dollars and it comes true like this. It's possible over time it's going to happen. But we do this constantly and Christians are so terrible about it. I mean, I work with Christians and non-Christians and the negativity of the Christian is so much worse than negativity of the non-Christian in my experience. It's, it's terrible. And the, the depth of the negativity is worse too. Cause I literally track when I do my breakthrough workshops with my clients, I'm typing down every negative thing they say so that we yeah. can go and do the release work to get back to your language, to do the release work on that negativity. And every one, every single client has that over 100 unique statements that they say about themselves. That's negative. I would, um, I, I really just kind of want to keep going on this path. I know we were going to talk about fatherhood and some other things, but I think I find this very interesting. I'd love to do this. And I think feel good father is going to feel the same way. So, um, let, let's keep going down this, uh, things that were really evocative to me about what you were saying, right? The national science foundation, 80% of language. I think the core thing for that I intellectualize is that our brain is a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so that means that as a survival mechanism, it is looking for threats. Mm -hmm. And so it's even the, the, it's funny because even in the language, it's kind of like you have a bad relationship with somebody at work or uh, with a provider or a sponsor or something like that. If you're a business owner or an employee, whatever the relationship happens to be, right? There's a bad relationship and you start being vitriolic about it. What What's happening in that moment is that your body in your brain is saying, I feel at threat. I feel at threat in some capacity. And because we, and because in our modern society, we don't actually have a lot of, of physical threats. Like we're right. overall, we're the safest that we've ever been. We're, we are really kind of entering this super age of overall abundance. It's like, like it's not, we are very close to global abundance, like everybody having everything they need to survive and, and, and thrive. Like we're, we're super close, um, closer than we've ever been in history to say that. And, and so, but we're, we're conditioned, we're still conditioned as subsistence farmers, Mm. right? We're, We're still conditioned to be a subsistence hunter, right? Where it's like, Oh, I'm, oh, I, uh, I'm, I'm hungry. Uh, I'm depressed because I'm not eating. Oh, I better go eat (laughs) or, oh, oh, look, there's a pride of lions. I'm not going to go over there (laughs) because I'm food for them, (laughs) right? That's dangerous. They suck. Uh, um, But I'd love to get back into the thing because that, that 80% language is so it's, I think it's one of the hardest things. And now I remember what I wanted to actually talk about is that I have this conversation with my wife all the time and that. There are some older hymns that are beautiful in their language, in reverence and stuff like that. And there are certain hymns where I'm like, I don't think of myself as as bad as this hymn is saying, as the mm. words that they're saying. And I think that that Christian guilt yep. is so huge and pervasive of like, well, if I if I virtue signal, and I'm going to use, I'm using that very intentionally, if I virtue signal to other Christians in my church, Therefore, they will accept me because they'll see me as broken too. It's yeah. like, well, well, yeah. hold on, because I don't think, and I've never thought of this. I don't think Jesus or God sees us as broken. Right. I I think they see us. I th- I think, and my faith says that, or what I believe is probably how I should express that. What I believe is that they don't see us as broken. They see us as complete and whole and holy, thanks to Jesus. Right. And even in his miracles, you know, when talking about Jesus's miracles, it's, it's a re it's a removing, it's, it's not a blessing up. We're not elevating up the humans that he healed. He's removing the pain and the bad stuff. So it's a restoration 
to the garden. It's a restoration to the original intent, right? Um, that's how I've always understood it, but I would love to hear your take on that and also how we facilitate that with, with men. Yeah. To help them get to a place of understanding who they are in Christ, who they are in their true identity in him now. Yes. When, whether the person I'm working with is a Christian or not, one of the things that we do is I already mentioned the breakthrough workshop, which, which in short is, well, I, let me preface this a little bit. So there's the way that I learned change is there's four requisites to change. And the first is release and release is getting to the root of whatever that negative emotion or limiting belief is. And there's a very specific technique that I use that works very quickly to, to get to that root. Once people find it, then we get to the root and we release the negativity that's associated with it. But you get to keep the learning from it, right? So mm. one of the ladies I recently worked with, she was, uh, a, well, and a, a guy also recently, they were had both been, a, had some sort of abusive relationship that was kind of a, a big deal for them. But we went to the root of that experience and we don't, I don't talk therapy with them. So what happens, they experience this in their own minds and they get away from it. They disassociate from it and experience it from like a third party perspective, like watching a movie. And so mm. then you get to think about what that experience was, let go of the emotions and limiting beliefs tied to it, and then press forward with your life into other experiences that are also tied to that emotion. Right. So we do that over and over, over the course of a four hour session with these core emotions. Once you're done with all of that, now you can go to the next stage of change, which is create and create mm -hmm. is simply, I now can create from a place of freedom because that head trash is not in the way anymore. My stinking thinking is gone. And so now I have these beautiful dreams of what I want to accomplish. My stinking thinking, the root, my root issue when I did my breakthrough workshop was that I didn't believe I was worthy of the cause that God called me to, worthy of the purpose that he called me to. Think about that. If I believed that I wasn't worthy of yeah. the purpose that God has for me, how is that going to impact my life? Every it's single the, area. This is the Moses story. Like This is literally Moses in the beginning right. of Exodus yeah. arguing with God. No, no, no. You got the wrong guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. It's the exact most story. And this, this is so common. And I think it's so funny for the longest time. I didn't, I, I wasn't really into as much the old Testament, but some of these stories are so good. And I started to, for me in my transformation, I started to say, which of the characters, which of the stories at this phase in my life, am I being, am I being Joseph? Am I being an arrogant little jerk? Am I being Joseph? <laughs> right. Am I being, I, am I being, um, uh, Jacob, am I being Jacob in the desert? Am I fighting too much? Am I trying to understand? Am I wrestling intellectually too much with what's happening? Am I just not feeling it? Am I being Jacob? Right. Am I, um, am I being Isaiah? Am I just letting my kids do whatever the heck they want and not really holding them accountable? Am I, have I just given up and just fallen into my trauma? Right. Have I picked a favorite and not spread my blessings? Right. Have I, you know, it's like, and like identifying them. And of course, those were all Genesis, but there are some other characters too that sure. are really great. But this was the Moses story. So please continue the, yeah, uh, the not worthy, the unworthiness. Yeah. So the long story short there is I dealt with that <laughs> and I, I was coached through it and it was quick. I mean, coached through it 10 minutes and I got the clarity around what the problem was and how to let go of it. And, and I did, and that's turned into a lot of change in my life. But because that was let go of, now I can create the future that I want, the future that God has for me, right? Mm. And how do you create it? Well, I have my clients create what's called an avatar. And it's essentially going, who do you want to be five to 20 years from now? Define that with I am statements, which is very Christian if you think about it, right? Jesus, God is the I am, and Jesus said right. he is I am as well. And so I am an athlete. I am a world-class coach. I am a amazing father and husband. I am, you know, I have these various statements that I say. And then what that means to me, this, this shapes my thinking in huge ways. 
it shapes the way I read scripture. It shapes the way I interact with other people. So now I'm creating that future, which because again, the head trash is gone. I'm not being dragged back like a, like people that diet, you know, they don't get rid of the head trash. So they gain weight again. They lose it. They mm. gain weight again, but they haven't gotten rid of the root issue as to why they're not losing weight. It's the same thing in any other scenario when we're holding on to things. So I've created stage three or step three is act. <laughs> right. Act? Act. Act. Got Big it. action. I, everything is created twice. You got to create it first in your imagination, right? Visualizing, create it as real as possible because, again, your conscious mind is the goal setter and your unconscious mind is the goal getter. And since mm. perception is reality, I have to create this, or I get to create this future and visualize it as clearly as possible, honoring God in the process, of course, right? Not trying to control too much. Then my mind goes, okay, I'll go get it for you. Thanks. Thanks for something hard. And then it goes and gets it, which allows me to then do the fourth thing, which is stay focused. And this is why this process works so well for, with people who have ADD, because that's the big issue for ADD people. We lose our focus and quick attention deficit disorder, right? We can really focus sometimes and then we lose it. <laughs> and then right. we beat ourselves up and then we procrastinate and then we're not motivated, all this stuff. But you let go of the trash, you create what you want, you can act on it, and then you don't lose focus because you're not being dragged back by the, the limiting beliefs and negative emotions. So the answer to the question that you asked a little bit ago is that avatar is the key. Creating that, once you've let go, of, once you've released, creating that future version of yourself and defining it clearly is the key to moving yourself forward in a really healthy way. And there's other components and steps to to pulling that off, but that's the gist of it. I, I think a high level review, and I'm sure that uh, if if fathers want to kind of engage and 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 see what this is about, that they can reach you at the various links, your website, all that other kind of stuff down in below and through the dad guide. So absolutely love it. This is so, um, this is it. So you were saying something I thought, um, that was really interesting to me and I, I'm curious on your take here. So you mentioned in multiple times, mentors, coaches, and groups that you were a part of. Yeah. And I think if, if we were, if I was going to sum up the entire theorem behind why does feel good fatherhood exist? What, what is happening? It's that as men, we have forgotten how to be in relationship. Mm. We don't really know how to ask for help for reasons. We don't really know how to have friendships. Mm -hmm. We, we, we don't think we're worthy of asking for things. Um, we, uh, we feel like if we ask for things, it's weakness. And, um, and this is much more of an older generation thing than I think a newer generation thing. I think that there's a little bit more things going on there. However, with the younger generation, there's a complete other set of issues. So we're just in sort of this men issue. And I personally think a lot of it just has to do with lack of community. It mean, just has to do with yeah. lack of role models. And so I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that. hundred uh, percent. You know, I've got church community. I've got gym community. I have family community. I have one-to-one -one community with, with a mentor. And then I have a coaching community, like all, all of that. And they... There is a tiny bit of overlap, but there's still one thing that's missing for me. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be real and honest here. I have a lot of friendships in there and they're, some of them are just acquaintances. Some of them are a little closer and some of them are a little bit closer than that, but there is no best friend. You know, I, mm. I left college or I left my college town, which is a city called San Luis Obispo, uh, 2014. And we moved, my wife and I and kids moved away and moved up to the Pacific Northwest. And I had a, a super tight best friend named Russ. And we're still friends. We hang out every summer with as families and it's great. But we're not living near each other. And I remember we, we lived in a barn, actually, my, my wife and I, before we, before we moved up here. And I remember being in front of the barn and he pulls up in his F-150 and we've got those U-Haul those pods that they, they have. And we had, I think five of them with all of our crap in the U-Haul pods. And we we're leaving that day and he pulls up in his truck and we talk for a moment, but before we even get to each other, we're both crying, right? Mm. We're crying because we know that this is it. It's over. Like we're never going to get to this type of relationship again between the two of us. Now we're going to be friends still. It didn't ruin our friendship by any means, but that level of friendship is gone and I'll never return. This is not going to. Yeah. And what's really unfortunate is since then, I haven't 
found it. I was on a path with another guy named John. And then he goes and moves to Spokane, which is six hours away. And I'm like, well, crap. You know, I'm I'm like so grateful to God because this was within the first year of us moving here. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I already have a dude friend that I'm getting close to. And it's quick. So to me, those communities are powerful. And part of the, the reason to have them is you can find that best friend. And I think having that companion, a Jonathan and a David type situation is beautiful and powerful. But in today's world, it's way harder because we're so busy and we have all these excuses and others have their own excuses. And so you, what, I had a video that I put out there and, and I called it the, my mandate video. You need, I said, this is your mandate. And it was, you need to go on man dates. <laughs> like, <laughs> ask a dude out to coffee, ask a dude out to fishing, to hunting, to whatever the heck you're both into and spend time together. So I'm doing those community things and they're beautiful, but it's this, I, there's still a lack on that one-to-one depth that I wish I had that I don't still. And it's coming, it'll happen, but it's yeah. not quite there yet. Yeah, good. I'm, I'm glad we ended on that because I was like, all right, Kyle, we're going to talk about some limiting beliefs here. <laughs> you said never, right? You said never have that again. All this kind of stuff. I was like, oh no, Kyle, <laughs> we're going to address some of these limiting beliefs here. But I, you know, I, I think I think it's the right path. Uh, you know, I, I and I I believe with like the you know, there's this transient nature to uh, achievement, status, all that kind of stuff that we're doing, right? It, it's so easy. Well, it's relatively easy at a certain socioeconomic level to move around a lot, to relocate your family, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's critical. I think that deep, that deep relationship, you know, there's, there's a, a really awful statistic that was very recent that it's like 20 to 25% of the male population doesn't have one close friend. Mm. And a close friend is typically defined as somebody that if you would to call in the middle of the night, they would come help you. Mm Mm-hmm. Like that's kind of what, how you would define a close friend yeah. and, um, amongst some other things, uh, that, that I think is tough. You know, we're in such a weird, it's such a weird world. Like I know, um, when I was growing up and, and by that, I mean, high school and college, it's like, if I called one of my close friends, cause I need to be picked up, they would just come pick me up. Yeah. But today I can imagine that conversation going, Hey, can you pick me up? They're like, get an Uber, you know, like they would, there'd be some, some other kind of conversation like that. So I, I think, uh, this kind of goes to, um, I I forget, I forget it, but she's in a circle of like Mary Harrington and some of these other great, uh, UK and European based thought leaders and journalists. And that was the idea that we have put technology in between all of the other normal interactions that you would have. And I heard this really great joke last night. It was, um, so it's, I think it's Marcus Brown, the YouTube, the tech YouTuber, right? Biggest guy in, in YouTube with uh, Hassan Minaj. And he was talking about, I went to a restaurant and I just asked for a menu. And then the waiter said, okay, well, our menus are on this QR code. And he was like, but I came to the restaurant to not use my phone. Mm. I want to sit here with my, with this person and not use my phone. And they were like, well, our, our only menus are on the phone. And he's like, Okay. So then he did that. And then the meal ended. And then he was like, okay, great. I would like to pay. Uh, can we have the bill please? And they were like, yeah, but you have to scan your phone. And then he said, and then, and then it was like, but in order to do all of this, you had to create an account and put your email address in and put your name in instead of a password. And he was like, so what was simple. And, and for those of you listening, I'm pantomiming with my remarkable, like putting a menu on the table became this seven step process that takes rather than the waiter dropping by walking you through the menu, which is this really nice social interaction to scan your phone, spend 30 minutes, not, or sorry, not 30 minutes, 30 seconds, two minutes, not interacting with the people at the table. By the time you get done, they're probably on their phone. Cause you know, there's nothing more boring than watching somebody else be on their phone. <laughs> and, <laughs> <that's true. laughs> and so it was just this crazy, like comedic skit. And he was like, did the technology actually need to exist right now? Like, right. did, is this actually enhancing human experience or is it getting in the way of human experience? So 
it's kind of interesting. Uh, what what would you tell a feel good father? Because this is very common. What you were just sharing. What would you tell a feel good father in order to go find mandates? What should they do? Yeah, find things that you like to do. Go do them and invite other guys to them, or go find guys that are doing it already and and get join. Be get some balls and go ask them if you can join them. Right? Like for me, I recently well not recently it's been a while now, but uh, I started doing CrossFit about. I don't know, maybe 15 months ago or something like that. And I was, I was scared. Like, to be honest, I was scared because the people in that community had been friends for, in some cases for like seven years, you know, right. and some of the people had owned the business and then sold it. And then somebody else was buying it. It's this kind of this intertwined complicated scenario. And I'm stepping into this, not knowing how to do what they're doing, not in the community at all. But I'm like, just grow, grow, grow a pair, buddy. And so I, I showed up consistently and I've showed up consistently every week since. And now I have this community of people and we're going to go on a hike next Saturday. And I work out with them on Saturday sometimes. And obviously on the regular week, I work out with them and I'm going to have coffee with somebody in a, in a couple of weeks. So p- place yourself in that community. Be, be of, of value and be freaking joyful. Also, be the happy guy in the group. Be the one that's encouraging, the one that's supportive, the one that shows positive energy because we all need that. And then reach out to them, get their numbers and reach out to them individually and and start to get to know them on an individual basis in whatever way that makes sense for the two of you. You know, it, it could it could be all kinds of things like I mentioned before. But you gotta gotta grow a pair and and be uncomfortable. Dating is uncomfortable and so what? Because the payoff is absolutely tremendous. It's totally, totally worth the payoff. So, um, that's what I would say. Awesome. Uh, Kyle, everybody.